General Martins, when he sends out his official bio sketch whenever he speaks, is a minimalist. Uh, and, and I don't intend to let him get, get away with it this time. Uh, Brigadier General Mark Martins is the Chief Prosecutor for the Office of Military Commissions. He, is, he and his staff are responsible for prosecuting alleged violations of the law of war in a specialized Article I court that was created by Congress, uh, first in the 2006 Military Commissions Act and more recently in the 2009 Military Commissions Act. Uh, he's had a distinguished career in the United States Army uh, as a soldier and as a, and as a judge advocate. He was commissioned in 1983 after finishing first in his class at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Uh, he went on to serve as a platoon leader and a brigade staff officer in the 82nd Airborne. John Altenberg cheers you for that. He was a Rhodes Scholar with first class honors at Balliol College in 1985. And then he went on to become a judge advocate through what's called the Funded Legal Education Program. Uh, and he graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. Uh, he also was serving on Harvard Law Review. Speaking of Harvard, uh, General Martins was awarded the law school's medical, uh, Medal of Freedom uh, just two years ago. While serving as an Army Judge Advocate, General Martins has been a criminal prosecutor and courts martial and operational lawyer, judge advocate, a staff judge advocate, and a chief of staff, and, and even served as a commander. Uh, his career has also included assignments as deputy legal counsel to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and as staff judge advocate for multinational force Iraq. In 2009, General Martins co-led the Interagency Detention Policy Task Force created by President Obama. And a part of that review uh, involved the task force recommending reforms to the military commissions process. And General Martins himself was instrumental in working with other agencies and with Congress in passage of the reforms that he'll be talking about today in the Military Commissions Act of, of 2009. Now, General Martins is, is widely respected among not only the military community, but the entire national security community uh, as an outstanding officer, uh, as a scholar, and as a lawyer. Um, it, you may not have seen this yet, but uh, the American Bar Association Journal, just within the last several days, posted a, a six-page feature article on Major General Martins, uh, General, Brigadier General Martins, I'm sorry to promote you. Uh, and, and one of the things that was a very significant part of that entire, uh, entire article was that even those who, who are critical of the military commission system at Guantanamo Bay will look at General Martins with a tremendous amount of respect, uh, not only for his humility, but for his scholarship and his dedication to the task that he has undertaken. Um, one of our colleagues, a close colleagues, Bobby Chesney, a professor of law at, at the University of Texas, I think said it well. He, he said, if in 2001, after 9-11, if we had had the 2009 Military Commissions Act, and if we had had General Martins as the chief prosecutor, much of the dialogue back and forth arguing about military commissions probably would have been minimized. And, and I think that's a, a very fair statement. Uh, I was sharing with General Martins <clears throat> that looking over the programs for conferences that lends his held or co-sponsored co uh, brought me back to 1994 uh, at Charlottesville when uh, this center and John Norton Moore Center at the University of Virginia co-sponsored uh, a conference on dealing with uh, violations of international humanitarian law. And then Major Martins was a discussant on a paper presented by the late Professor Robinson Everett on, guess what, national tribunals and military commissions. And General Martins, I, I think it's safe to say we've all, and you particularly, have come a distance. Welcome to Duke, and welcome to the conference. Well, thank you, Professor Silman. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, it's, uh, thank you for that gracious and warm welcome and for giving me the opportunity to come to Duke Law uh, having spent a good deal of the last 10 years in uh, rural parts of Iraq and Afghanistan, when I get the chance to come to a true hall of distinguished scholarship and higher learning, I'm reminded of one of the more celebrated instances in which a backwoodsman you know, 
came to the, the academy and in in an institution of higher learning, it was none other than uh, 1858. You remember Abe Lincoln's having this series of debates with Stephen O. Douglas, Illinois senatorial race, a couple of years before he's going to become our president. He goes to Knox College, Illinois, then and now a preeminent private liberal arts college, center of higher learning. Lincoln, of course, self-schooled, no formal education to speak of, goes to Knox. Uh, this actually is going to become a pivotal moment, some historians would say, in our history. If Lincoln had not, in that debate at Knox, denounced slavery on moral terms, uh, historians think you know, a whole course of peace and then war would have been different, catalytic moment in the breakup of the Democratic Party and so forth. Uh, so anyway, so the faculty at Knox has set up scaffolding outside the windows of the second floor of the old main building at Knox. Knox is a junction town, people coming from all over the Midwest. Thousands of people gathered out in front of Knox, so they put scaffolding up so that the two candidates could be heard. So Stephen O. Douglas, compact man, far more prominent at the time, goes out first, gets through the window, no problem. Lincoln, of course, tall, gangly, you know, kind of is awkwardly getting through this window, gets out onto the scaffold, and he is said to have quipped, well, it's good now to be able to say that I've been through college. <laughs> and I'm not going to be able to say that I've been through the great Duke Law School on my way to this session here today, but it certainly is an honor. Uh, this simple soldier certainly has great gratitude for the opportunity to do it. Now, if, something, if some of what I says, say uh, doesn't reach uh, Duke law standards, it isn't quite there in terms of coherence, <laughs> compelling character, it gives you indigestion, this is a lunch session. You can, uh, I've got plenty of people I can blame. It's good to be going to, to a lecture with... Um, with people who are responsible for my training, not only Professor Silliman, but I'm seeing Mark Warren, Dave Hayden, John Charvat, Kurt Warner, others, so I can share responsibility with them. Um, I can also attribute the, uh, the Law Ethics and National Security Center uh, to a penchant to go toward things that are between disciplines. Um, this center, 20 years ago, established because the existing disciplines didn't quite describe the post-Cold uh, post War world uh, we were confronted with, needed to develop a new way of thinking. If we're going to achieve peace, prosperity, freedom, avert wars, we needed to have uh, a concept of national security and law that wasn't oxymoronic. And we needed to have people realize those things aren't mutually exclusive aren't in tension with, others, uh, with each other. And I would submit to you that the Military Commissions Act of 2009 that Judge and Professor Silliman talked about is just the sort of topic uh, that we need to discuss uh, in national security law and ethics. Uh, Congress now has spoken, not just in the Military Commissions Act of 2006 and 2009, but in five separate pieces of legislation, we also had the Detainee Treatment Act, which mentioned military commissions, and two successive national um, authorization acts, uh, defense authorization acts, that uh, prominently feature military commissions. So we now have legislation, and we're dealing with a, a difficult, difficult set of national security issues. Um, the events of September 11th confronted all of us with uh, a challenge, a security challenge that our government elected to respond to at the intersection of terrorism and armed conflict. That was a controversial path, and I fully acknowledge the controversial nature of that path. Um, and whatever you think of that, and whatever you think of the name and the image of Guantanamo, important to, to look to what our own Supreme Court has said. They've said that on taking that path, there were significant legal errors in the, in the framework that was established. In 2004, the court held that somebody detained under the law of armed conflict has to have a meaningful way to challenge the basis of that detention. In 2006, 
The court found that a military commission lacked the authority to proceed. This was on a mandamus petition. It was prior to trial. Lacked the authority to proceed because it departed from court martial practice without, practic without showing a practical need. So it violated the UCMJ, Article 36, requiring procedures to only depart if practical need is demonstrated. And, it al and also that common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions that I'll talk about, uh, requiring individuals to be tried by regularly constituted courts, affording all of the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples, that that standard was not met. And then in 2008, in the Boumedian case, uh, the court guaranteed habeas corpus to detainees at Guantanamo. We are not where we were. Again, as Professor and Judge Silliman said, we're, I, would, I will submit to you that, again, whatever you have in your head of the image in the name of Guantanamo, we are at a stage of accountable and open institutions, having gone through uh, an evolution over the past decade that has yielded a process that I will uh, seek to persuade you, at least get you thinking about some of the arguments for why this is an accountable a uh, transparent process that lives up to everything we want of the United States and that our great allies can see this as very much in the highest traditions of American United States uh, behavior on the international uh, uh, stage. Okay, so military commissions. I'm going to say four things up front before describing them and then I'm going to get into anticipating describing some of the criticisms and some of the responses to get you warmed up for the Q&A. Four things up front. First, I want to make a distinction between detention under the law of armed conflict and trial for violations of the law of war. I mean, these are related topics, but I want to make that distinction. If you can imagine a box with four quadrants, you could either be four <coughs> military commission, pre uh, law of armed conflict detention and military commissions. For both of those, you can be against both of them. You got two different, and then you could be for one and against the other, for the other against one, okay? So you've got uh, two different authorities and things happening here. You're detaining somebody as a combatant on this battlefield under the law of war, vice trying somebody. I'm making the distinction up front because I have found thoughtful people from around the world in every one of those quadrants. You can, uh, and, uh, and the idea of being for military commissions and against a long-term detention under the law of armed conflict that starts spanning decades is a thought I want to perhaps populate a little uh, with you here today. Okay, so that's, that's the first point. The second point is that since 2006, since that Supreme Court decision in 2006, all three branches of our government acknowledge that that common Article III standard applies. That we were in a, we're in a non-international armed conflict. This common Article III of the four Geneva Conventions of 1949, sometimes called a convention within the conventions, because it deals with conflicts not of an international character. And we're dealing with non-state actors, individuals who are guerrillas, who are not carrying arms openly, not subordinated to a commander who is obligated to comply with the laws of war and not wearing a fixed distinctive insignia recognizable at a distance, but somebody uh, acting out of, outside of that. But we are in that common Article Three, basic humane standards rule that is in the, the all four Geneva Conventions. That's why it's called the common article. And it requires that when you subject someone to trial, that you are ensuring that they're before a regularly constituted court, affording all of the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable by civilized people. So important point, because prior to 2006, that was not the case. Another third thing I'll say here up front is, in addition to common Article 3, since 2010, and this was at the end of the process Professor Silliman spoke of, of detention policy review that I had the privilege of uh, helping chair. 
the United States government formally announced that two other sources of law relating to due process in this realm, uh, particularly of non-international armed conflict, uh, were going to apply. Well, one is actually Additional Protocol 1, Article 75, which gives additional procedural guarantees. And then the other is all of Additional Protocol 2. The United States announced in early 2010 that we see those as, uh, or we, we are, uh, see ourselves as following them out of a sense of legal obligation. Opinio Juris, so which, uh, which has, has come up here today, is one part of customary international law. You have to have the state practice, but this Opinio Juris piece of it is uh, certainly very important. So that's since 2010, we are observing uh, Article 75 of Additional Protocol 1 and Additional Protocol 2 out of a sense of legal obligation. And we then reviewed our procedures and concluded that clearly we are in compliance with those standards as well. The last thing, uh, the fourth of these initial four things I'll mention is uh, no, uh, principles of complementarity and concurrent jurisdiction. You know, one of the, the, the early objections that I'll get registered, particularly from an international audience, is, hey, why not do this in an international court, right? An international criminal court or something like the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, why not try somebody within those uh, tribunals which have jurisdiction over violations of the law of war? And I, I just make the point that those international courts do not omit from the structure of enforcement national courts. And the Geneva Conventions, of course, acknowledge that military courts are going to be among those national courts with jurisdiction to try. So it's very important to show that uh, the jurisdiction is concurrent and complementary. There was never an intent to snuff out national forums. And of course, if you want maximum accountability for violations of the law of war, you certainly want those procedural guarantees in Common Article 3 and Additional Protocol 2, but you want as many different jurisdictions to be able to try them and to give fair trials and open trials. So those are four important points up front uh, just to show that we, we see ourselves very much as within the world order, within that uh, system of nation states seeking to comply with, with the law of war and with international law. Okay, so what are military commissions? Many here who practiced all their lives uh, criminal or um, all their uh, law practicing lives in military criminal courts know a lot of this stuff, but I'll review the field quickly uh, to give a sense to those who may not. Um, this is a system of criminal trial courts, and it it's starts with a process that I'll call, or it's uh, moved along by a process I'll call referral. And let me give you the, the different players in that. Uh, investigation or information showing that a violation of the law of war has occurred comes to a prosecutor, comes to somebody in my office. We, we look at the evidence, look at what's admissible under the law, <coughs> determine that there's a realistic prospect of success on the merits, and swear charges swear charges that a crime is committed. I then must endorse those charges and forward them to a convening authority. Now, in the military justice system, which this system is based upon, that's a commander. When I was in an, a commander in Afghanistan, I had general court-martial convening authority as part of my command to discipline troops, to ensure the accomplishment of a, of a mission, the maintenance of morale, welfare, uh, and discipline. Uh, so a commander typically has convening authority. In this system, a separate officer, accountable officer, uh, is appointed by the Secretary of Defense. And that's, that's uh, retired Vice Admiral Bruce McDonald, the able and respected former Judge Advocate General of the Navy. He serves as the convening authority. He then has, at this point, to compare it to a uh, civilian trial system, he has a grand jury function. He must review the charges determine that the evidence warrants the charges, that the accused is the one who did it, and that the offense states, or what's charged states an offense under the law. 
If he finds that, he will then refer, that's that term I mentioned, <laughs> refer the case to a military commission. And a judge is appointed at that point by the chief judge of the trial judiciary. Now, this judge is not an Article III, as Professor Silliman mentioned. This is an Article I court. So these are not Article III judges under our Constitution, lifetime tenure ju judges um, nominated by the president, advice and consent from the Senate, and then appointed by the president. These are uh, typically 06s in our services. We got some very distinguished judges here. Here's Gary Brockington. I saw him before. Uh, judge, we got Judge Frank Whitney, who's actually a judge in, uh, when he's not on, on active duty. He's a judge in the uh, trying cases in North Carolina in federal district court. So we got distinguished practitioners of criminal law. They are uh, impressively independent, though they don't have lifetime tenure. I, I would ask you to go look at their, what they've decided and determine if you would agree they are independent. They have frequently stood up to... Um, and indicators of command influence or illicit influence and uh, have done so proudly uh, with great independence. Um, so you have a, a judge who's appointed by the chief judge of the trial judiciary. They're in a separate chain of command to further distance you know, any uh, possibilities of command influence. There's also a strong statutory prohibition, well understood within the system uh, against command influence. It also protects me and my independent prosecutorial decisions and all of those who work with me. Uh, so that you now have a military commission and a presiding judge. Okay, the military commission, what is the commission? Well, in its first sense, it is that board of officers. Uh, in a capital case, that's 12 or more officers chosen from a population of about 200,000 worldwide. You know, these are officers serving on the demilitarized zone in Korea, serving in Afghanistan, serving in post camps and stations around the United States, out on ships. Uh, they are uh, chosen by the convening authority on statutory criteria. So he's got a grand jury function, also has a function in choosing the jury pool pre-examination and challenge, but he chooses it on the basis of statutory criteria, age, education, training, experience, length of service, and judicial temperament. So you have a, a jury pool chosen by the convening authority on a convening order. When he refers the case, he convenes the military commission. Judge presides over it. These jurors are then subject to rigorous examination and challenge by prosecution and defense counsel. Defense counsel are very capable teams. Anybody who sees our proceedings in Guantanamo would agree these are sharply adversarial proceedings with accused well represented by counsel at government expense. So you have examination for cause. Judge is required to grant challenges for cause liberally to eliminate anybody who's got prior no uh, knowledge of the case or the charges, prior knowledge of the accused. You get an impartial fact finder coming to the case cold. And there's also peremptory challenge can't be based on a scriptive criteria, you know, uh, invidious criteria, race, and so forth. Uh, there's same sort of Batson v. Kentucky uh, objections to that. Um, but uh, can, there is peremptory challenge for the same sorts of reasons to get you that neutral fact finder. And, and that's the, the basic setup, I think, very recognizable to those familiar with our adversarial system of criminal justice. The trial that ensues is one that has all of the protections that are demanded by our values. The accused is presumed innocent. The prosecution must prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, the highest standard known in our law, the most rigorous, challenging standard. Uh, the accused has a right to counsel, as I've mentioned, uh, at government expense, and choice of counsel. Uh, the accused is entitled to notice of charges in a language he or she understands. Specific charges now putting them on notice of specific crimes that they are alleged to have committed under the law of war. Uh, right to be present, right against self-incrimination, protection against the use of any statements they have made obtained as a result of torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. And the standard for admissibility of those statements is voluntariness. 
important, important changes from the 2006 to the 2009 Act. Um, the accused is entitled to evidence. So cross, certainly cross-examine all of the government's witnesses, present evidence on his or her behalf, use the process, the compulsory process of the state on the accused's behalf to get evidence and call witnesses, exculpatory evidence, right? I have an obligation to provide not only the basis of our case, what substantiates the, uh, what evidence substantiates the charges, but also evidence that undermines my case, so-called Brady v. Maryland evidence in our case law. And it, it extends even to, to evidence that undermines the credibility of prosecution witnesses, so-called Giglio evidence. To, to name the case for which that stands in our system. So I've got to present exculpatory evidence and give that, affirmatively seek it out and get that uh, to the accused. I mentioned the impartial decision maker. Along with that lay jury, and this is a jury. Uh, in fact, uh, a great, uh, Frederick Bernays Wiener wrote a great article of tracking the origins of the military court martial and military commission back to the first Mutiny Act in the 17th century in England. Why do we get the number 13 in our military commissions? Well, it goes back to the common law jury being brought into the military system in the first Mutiny Act. Uh, common law jury of 12 plus one presiding officer or judge. It's the same tradition. Impartial fact finder. We have this in our common law systems, a non-professional fact finder, not a non-lawyer, who's supposed to find the facts with the instructions of the judge uh, and be impartial. And thus we have exclusionary rules, another protection, uh, to ensure that we don't have uh, evidence that may be more prejudicial than probative. Uh, we'll talk in a, a while about hearsay here. But so we have a, a lot of the same exclusionary rules in our rules of evidence apply to this system. Self-representation, qualified self-representation. You're not required to take that lawyer, that military lawyer that may be detailed from the JAG Corps to an accused or uh, the um, civilian learned counsel that you may be detailed in a, um, assigned in a, a capital case, you can represent yourself. You know, we all have heard the saying that you know, he who has himself for a client, or he who, he who represents himself has a fool for a client. But you can do that in this system, as you can, you know, under the Ferretta v. California doctrine in our civilian courts, knowingly, voluntarily, intelligently waive your right to counsel. So qualified self-representation, protection against double jeopardy, being put twice in jeopardy of life or limb for the same offenses, protection against ex post facto law, the creation of a law following the conduct in question, and a right of appeal. The first level of appeal is to a United States Court of Military Commission review, a civilian military court with experienced practitioners uh, that has a uh, appellate review scope that extends to facts. They can question matters of fa uh, fact as well as matters of law. And then from the US CMCR up to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit and Article III Court in our federal system, and then to the Supreme Court. So you have this, this panoply of rights uh, to yield a fair trial in accordance with all of our values. This system addresses a defined menace, Al-Qaeda and associated forces. These are groups that do not carry arms openly, that um, hide in the shadows of international boundaries and ungoverned terrain. They use modern forms of technology, information technology, uh, off-the-shelf technology, global positioning system receivers, every form of, of new off-the-shelf technology. They rely upon that technology to, to, to combine with others in unprecedented ways, to figure out how to get across those boundaries with travel documents. Is it an ex existential threat? I would say not. Uh, this is not a, a threat comparable to the organized national threat from Nazi Germany in World War II, but it's a serious and adaptive threat. Important to have a clear view of this threat. And it is adaptive, but it's, uh, it's well-defined within this system. So let me, let me anticipate some of the criticisms of this system. And 
and then and again get you warmed up for some question and answer. I like to put these six categories of criticisms into the six uns. That military commissions are unfair, unsettled, unknown, uh, unnecessary, unbounded, and for good measure, un-American. Okay, so six ons. Let's just go through those. I'll give you a very quick sort of the main criticism. I will give you something to sub, uh, consider on the other side. And then we'll, uh, we'll go to question and answer. Okay, so unfair. This is the allegation that, uh, that we're, we're letting in hearsay, that we're allowing you know, secret evidence to come in that's uh, tainted with coercion. Very important criticism that is an attack on the legitimacy of the system. I will submit that where we are today in an accountable system counters that. The, the, the aperture for hearsay is quite narrow. It's slightly broader than the aperture in our normal rules of evidence. And if you look at international courts, often grounded heavily in this regard in a civil law system, hearsay is not a, a major barrier to the evidence getting to the fact finder, which of course in those systems is a often a panel of judges. But the departures that we have deal with evidentiary exigencies that come from armed conflict. Armed conflict. Uh, William Shawcross, who is the uh, son of Sir Hartley Shawcross, and he became Lord Hartley Shawcross, the British prosecutor at Nuremberg, is, says that if the 21 defendants at Nuremberg were <laughs> transported magically to Guantanamo, they'd be astonished at their rights, privileges, and entitlements. And he's right. He's right. Now, the way in which our views of a fair trial have evolved, and we've undergone a, a revolution, really, in constitutional criminal procedure domestically in the United States since that time, that that's the right answer. I mean, that's the way it should be. But these are fair courts, and they are uh, administered by these military commissions and independent officers, officers with independence, to carry out the law and to do so, to do their duty, uh, having sworn an oath under the Constitution. Okay, so there's you've got the, the allegation and a, a, a start of an answer on unfair. Unsettled. This is the notion that these are courts that have to deal with so many new issues. Uh, one component of justice is that it is settled, that we know where we're going and what, the, what justice looks like, and we can apply fair procedures uh, fairly. Um, and that the, the plethora of new questions, new jurisdictional issues, issues relating to the offenses, make the system too unsettled to yield justice. The comeback to that is that this is a system that has very clear sources of law. Military criminal law, which is a a well-developed, settled body of law from our Uniform Code of Military Justice of 1950 and subsequent legislation and practice, and that the Military Commissions Act of 2009 directs us to federal criminal practice and law in certain areas. One of those is classified information procedures. The 2009 Military Commissions Act incorporates the 1980 Classified Information Procedures Act used in our federal criminal trials, plus the intervening case law. So we have a, a stable, well-developed uh, body of law to deal with one of the important sets of issues in national security cases, which is how do you handle those things that still are genuinely secrets? And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about allegations relating to classified evidence and secrets and so forth, but this is the unsettled. So we have clear... Uh, clear bodies of law, military uh, statutory and case law, federal statutory and case law, other areas where we're directed to go to federal law due to congressional concerns about representation and so forth is that an accused shall have an opportunity to obtain witnesses and evidence that shall be comparable to an accused in an Article III court. So we are required for uh, issues of witnesses, evidence, getting resources, to the, uh, to the accused and counsel, we look to federal cases expressly because we're navigated to it by the statute. This idea that you know, judges are gonna have to make decisions about disputes 
making the system unsettled, I would ask you, you know, intellectually, honestly, to look at that. I mean, the law books here in the Duke Law Library are filled with reports of cases that were disputes about what rule to apply. That's what courts do, is they, they settle the application of a rule to a particular case. And this system raises issues, un certainly important issues, often case dispositive issues, evidentiary issues, other things, jurisdictional issues, in a methodical way for thoughtful law-governed resolution. And we have you know, aggressive adversarial process to do that, as well as judges to do it, and, and the right of appeal up. So that, that's, that's the unsettled criticism and, and the initial comeback. Come back to it if you want and question and answer. Um, unknown. This is the criticism that military commissions are opaque. No one knows about them. They're operating in secret. The, uh, and you, you can add your own layers to that criticism, w which you hear quite a bit. The comeback is they are transparent. Um, you, if you go to www.mc.mil, you can read same-day transcripts of all of our proceedings. You can go, anybody uh, who can get to Washington, D.C. from here and show a picture ID can get into courts, just as same, same level of difficulty to get in as to get into a federal trial. You can go to Fort Meade and watch the proceedings uh, at Fort Meade by closed circuit television. And observers, 60 media organizations come down to Guantanamo to cover these trials. Uh, there have been 110 hours of courtroom proceeding. A lot of stuff happens in these uh, tribunals outside of the court in terms of discovery and motions filing and written pleadings. But all of the evidence is certainly going to be taken uh, in open session in public uh, that I'm going to present. The prosecution doesn't want to rely on secret evidence. But out of 110 hours of proceedings, how many seconds of that you think have been closed to the public? Zero, zero. There have been three occasions where there was an initial interruption and those very few minutes, a couple of minutes, have been restored with verbatim transcript within hours or a, a day or so. So zero of that proceedings of 100. Am I promising there will be no closed sessions? No. Classified Information Procedures Act and uh, similar proceedings in federal court do allow for certain hearings to take place out of the view of the public. If there is an overriding public interest, either due to national security or some other overriding public interest, we're applying the press enterprise two factors with regard to closure. You have to have an overriding interest. That has to be articulated by the judge. It can be challenged by counsel. It's another thing that can be raised for appeal. It's got to be preserved on the record, Those, the rationale for it. It's got to be done with a scalpel and not a a blunderbuss instrument. It's got to be narrowly tailored. You've got to protect only that information that would go against the public interest if you let it in, and then subject to appeal. So uh, we have the same protections on the, the, uh, the notion that this is unknown. Uh, so you've got the criticism, the, the initial comeback. Uh, how about unnecessary? OK, well, we've had all these reforms to military commissions over this decade of creating an accountable set of institutions. Uh, you've come close to federal courts. Martins, you're talking about federal courts here and there. If those are such good standards and the, and the distance has narrowed, why do you need military commissions? Are military commissions unnecessary? And I, I am prone to talk about federal practice. There are nine uh, very experienced national security law attorneys, uh, federal prosecutors who work on on the military commissions uh, detailed to the office of the <coughs> chief prosecutor. We talk about comparable rules in federal court all the time. We are directed, as I mentioned, by statute to use those uh, rules in certain areas. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm saying they're identical systems. I, the, both systems yield fair trials, but there are important differences that in a narrow category of cases, Experts sitting around the table, counter-terror uh, experts, law enforcement agents, prosecutors, look at the cases and the facts and say, the better forum is a military commission. Uh, you will never hear me say bad things about our federal courts. They've handled many cases in front of civilian juries in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Virginia. A uh, very important part of our national security and law enforcement counterterrorism 
institutions. But there is a narrow category of cases where military commissions are the better choice. Now, there's a very prudential reason why we can't, we have to bring certain cases there if we're going to get a fair trial with robust due process, large amounts of discovery to put the accused on notice of why the state is holding him or her uh, beyond a reasonable doubt rigor. If you're going to get that um, in a military commission or in a, uh, with regard to a detainee in Guantanamo Bay, you've got to do it by military commission. You know, the, Congress has said now repeatedly, no money's going to be expended to bring detainees from Guantanamo to the United States. So that's a very first line um, reason why we, we need to use commissions. Um, when prosecutors with concurrent jurisdiction are looking at a case, the first thing they look at is there some legal impediment to me bringing the case. Well, there's a legal impediment for federal prosecutors to bring cases into federal court. But what about other reasons? Well, um, two, two basic evidentiary ones come up in these kinds of discussions quite a bit. Now, one is I mentioned that the standard for admissibility was voluntariness. Another standard could have been that you must warn an individual and let, let the individual know he or she has a right to remain silent, has a right to counsel. Miranda warnings in our system. A, short, a, a, a method in the analysis to ensure you're getting a voluntary, help ensure you're getting a voluntary confession or a statement from an accused. That's not the case in, in military commissions. In both courts martial and federal courts, you have a Miranda rule. Courts martial, it's Article 31 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, actually predates Miranda, but a lot of very similar case law uh, that you require a warning. The, the standard in military commissions is that the statement must be voluntary. If you're familiar with pre-Miranda case law, think Schneckloth v. Bustamante, pre-Miranda, totality of the circumstances, voluntariness. If you reflect on things and consider that you could have a, a soldier out in a place like Kandahar collecting evidence, being lawful, doing all the right things, but not a trained law enforcement officer, gets a statement from an accused, doesn't read the accused's rights, but the totality of the circumstances indicates the accused's will is not overborne, not being mistreated, you have a voluntary statement. That will come in in a military commission. And although there are some minor exceptions, narrow exceptions to the case law on Miranda in federal court, one is the public safety exception, New York v. Quarles, generally, non-Mirandai statements are not going to get in, and prosecutors have a great risk that they're going to encounter a federal judge who's going to take a very, very narrow view of something that's on Mirandai's. So that's an important one that will come up. Another is this uh, hearsay, you know, out-of-court statements offered by a party to prove the truth of, of the matter asserted. So hearsay statements, things that have been disfavored in our law since, you know, Sir Walter Raleigh's trial. You know, the idea that someone, submit, you submit an affidavit that's really damning and it comes from someone out of court that you don't get a chance to cross-examine. This is disfavored in the common law and in Anglo-American tradition. And it's, uh, it's disfavored in military commissions too. There is an, a, a slightly broader aperture for hearsay. And I would submit that that is because you're getting things from uh, places where witnesses are now going to be unavailable years later where uh, the, you, you may have very probative information that's contextualized and corroborated by physical evidence that you have and other indicia of reliability. And the proponent of the hearsay under the Military Commissions Act of 2009 has the burden to show why the, the hearsay is probative, reliable. It goes to an important piece of the case. And the witness is unavailable. You can't, you, you, it's the best evidence that you have. The judge has to take into consideration whether the declarant's will was overborne, this voluntariness concern as well, and that the interests of justice are served. And remember, these are the judges that try our service members and are applying general hearsay rules out of our uh, military rules of evidence, which look on hearsay very much like uh, federal rules of evidence. So a narrower or a, a slightly broader aperture for hearsay, but again, uh, in, under the law of armed conflict and given the nature, the necessity to try to get the best evidence you can, 
and, and closely scrutinized, right? You don't want to be bringing in hearsay that came from coercion. I mean, this is an important issue, but you've got that sharply adversarial process and a judge who's got to do the interests of justice as a protection for it. So those are some of the areas that make commissions different. You also have this officer panel, which though not a Sixth Amendment jury of one's peers chosen randomly from the district wherein the crime shall have been committed. No, you don't have a civilian jury, but you have an institution that's older than our federal courts. I mean, Washington appointed a military commission in 1780 to figure out what happened up in, uh, in West Point when uh, Andre, a British officer, was found to have been involved with Benedict Arnold in, in getting the British custody of a major fort. So Washington appoints a military commission, a jury-based system that has great pedigree and can be available to the country, if necessary, to be an impartial fact finder. Okay, so that's unnecessary. You've got distinctions between the system that I believe no chief executive would throw away. We need all of the instruments of national power and authority to deal with modern threats and military commissions within a narrow role can help serve that purpose. Uh, unbounded, this is the criticism that military, military commissions are military jurisdiction and you, you, you don't want to do is allow military jurisdiction to start displacing, undercutting democratic processes, civilian processes and institutions that require, you know, to be, it must be the dominant uh, jurisdiction in our system. That, that military commissions are going to involve the chief prosecutor bringing charges against a little old lady in Switzerland who writes a check that un, unbeknownst to her gets to the Tamil Tigers, you know, a terrorist group. You know, this is, the, this is sort of the hypothetical you'll get on the, on the unbounded score. Well, that couldn't happen. Um, it is just that, a hypothetical, a creative law school hypothetical. Couldn't happen um, because our jurisdiction is well-bounded. It applies in hostilities, okay? And this is a question of fact. Every one of the elements of the offenses that I can try under the Military Commissions Act, 32 of them, has as an element that it took place in the context of and associated with hostilities. And that has, that has grip, that test has grip. Uh, if you're familiar with the Tadic case in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, that was basically the instruction in one of our cases to the jury. The jury has to find that hostilities existed as a matter of fact. This is protracted armed violence of a scope, character, intensity, that it rises above internal disturbances and tensions. It's not just sporadic acts of violence. It's got to be protracted armed violence such that a state is going to respond to it with its armed forces. And it is a question of fact. It's not determined, it, it's not determined by what the parties say about it, although that can be part of the indication. So Al-Qaeda declares war on us in a fatwa, that's relevant, it's not dispositive. What we do about it is important to the analysis, but the point is that that's, got, that's an element of the offense. So the judge is going to give an instruction based on law, and it's not just the Tadic case, if, um, if you're familiar with Secretary of War Elihu Root's letter on the Philippine insurrection, you know, this, this, this standard of what really makes armed conflict, and uh, Professor Schmidt was dealing with many of these discussions in an armed attack uh, discussion this morning, it rises to the level of something that's governed by the law of war. Okay, so that's a, a barrier to this being an unbounded, amorphous jurisdiction. Another is that the accused has to be an unprivileged belligerent. I talked about that up front. Article four of the Third Geneva Convention. Think Article Four. you know, the carrying arms openly. The, and we had another, a great primer on that this morning related to unprivileged belligerency. So you, you get immunity under the laws of war if you are in a, a uniform and you're complying with the rules and you observe the principle of distinction that lies at the heart of the law of war. Um, if you're, you're opting into the military commission system. Again, fully fair system, transparent. But you're opting in. You have to opt in. You have to be an unprivileged belligerent. And again, that's something that's going to be found through the process. It's not just you know, taken as writ from outside 
some in, you know, outside agency telling you that. You've got to, it's going to be found within the process with this judge and a sharply adversarial proceeding and the present, presentation of concrete evidence. These, so that's another bulwark against this unbounded. Another is that the, viol, the violation, what you're charging, is a violation of the law of war. And attacking civilians, attacking civilian objects, murder and rape in the context of hostilities have been our longstanding war crimes, treachery and perfidy, uh, using the uh, laws of war against your adversary. So these are, they have to be longstanding uh, law of armed conflict violations. And what you get out of it is a system I will submit to you is not, not unbounded. Uh, and then um, un American. For those of you who think that military commissions are foreign to our history, I would ask you to go look at some of the reviews done of military courts by Abraham Lincoln, with whom we started the talk here. Abe Lincoln reviewed hundreds of military commissions, and he was not shy about overturning them. His record was in over a third of those, he, gave, he either disapproved the findings of the military court Remember, these were Article II military commissions, if you will. They were done under executive branch authority. There wasn't a statute giving a, a right of appeal through the USCMCR up to our um, Supreme Court. So you had Lincoln being the appellate judge, if you will. History has shown Lincoln was wiser than many of our judges of the day. But Lincoln gave substantial clemency or disapproved more than a third of the cases that he had brought to him. And I would ask you to look at the record of trial of one John Yates Bell in February of 1865. Remember, Lincoln in January of 1865, now popularized in a recent movie, in January is helping get the 13th Amendment of the Constitution through the House, make permanent the Emancipation Proclamation that he had issued earlier in the war. That's what he's doing in January 1865. In March of 1865, what's he doing? He's given his famed second inaugural address, one of the most eloquent statements that right can't be reduced to might. In February, he is struggling with the military commission of John Yates Bell. Bell is a Confederate officer operating out of uniform in upstate New York. Not in uniform. Civilian courts in New York are open. Bell tries to derail a civilian train, kill civilians, violate the basic principle of distinction in armed conflict. He's tried by military commission, and the case goes to Lincoln. Lincoln approves the military commission conviction in sentence of John Yates Bell. Okay, now you can say lots of things. This doesn't settle, you know, Lincoln's record on civil liberties in wartime. It doesn't certainly doesn't settle modern controversial issues about military commissions. It does undercut this notion that commissions are un-American. Okay, that, that's an ahistorical view, and it doesn't reflect uh, the facts. Okay, those are the six uns. Uh, uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. I will, I will say that for our international audience, and I, I guess you got the cliff notes here, a little, little article from uh, England, I've gone to international audiences and talked, and some people say, well, this can never be seen as credible and to the America's highest standards in the international community. I beg to differ. I've spent some time with people, and including Pashtuns, from where we got a lot of the prisoners we now have in Guantanamo. And my favorite Pashtun proverb is, Yao mum lakat, be la kanun tsaka, de zangal haisiatlari. A country without law is a jungle. If we are law governed, if we live up to our values, if we don't see national security and law as a contradiction in terms, we can persuade individuals that these trials are fair. And so with that, let me open up for questions here. Please, your questions? <clears throat> Sir. Julie. Thank you very much for that detailed overview. Um, You've been speaking about military commissions and provided a really elaborate um, description of procedural elements and protections that they afford defendants. Obviously, those are very different from the procedures that are afforded to um, detainees challenging their 
detention. Right. Um, two differences that just come to mind off the top of my head are the standard of proof is lower in that context, right. and hearsay is largely admissible or more admissible. Um, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about the um, sort of the, the reasons why that might make a lot of sense or might be troublesome. What are your thoughts oh, on, on great, those differences? I mean, it goes back to my initial request that you see detention under the law of armed conflict separately, right? I mean, you're, you're exactly on it. The average habeas case, okay, remember, we're doing as well as we can do in our institutions by individuals who are detained under the law of armed conflict. We, we've given them habeas corpus, okay, I'm talking about Guantanamo detainees here. So the uh, federal district court, U.S. federal district court in D.C., here's the case. It's a preponderance of the evidence standard that somebody is part of Taliban, Al-Qaeda, or associated forces engaged in armed conflict against the United States or a coalition partner, including those who have uh, uh, directly supported hostilities in aid of such forces. So you have a standard there of detention, just detainability. Average amount of discovery in a habeas case, maybe a couple of hundred pages. You're dealing with filaments of facts about somebody's visit based on hearsay to a camp in Pashtun land, uh, and maybe something that came out of a raid that connected to him. Meanwhile, you got a detainee with counsel saying, I wasn't anywhere near there, or you know, rebutting it. This is tough. We're putting our federal judges, you know, independent Article III, life tenure judges. That's a, I mean, we're giving them the process we can give them, right? Tough call. Uh, and that is a much different um, picture, right, than a criminal trial with uh, defense counsel teams paid for by the government. Again, uh, Congress felt very uh, strongly about ensuring they had good representation given the distance of Guantanamo, the, the history and the difficulties. So, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. It's a very difficult process. And in terms of closure, I mean, lots of these proceedings are taking place outside of public view on VTC from Guantanamo. So it's, I mean, it's, a, it's an important point. We're going to need to have both. I think there are going to be cases you can't try, and you've got to be revisiting it. You've got to be having a separation of power and a balance of uh, checks and balances. But um, I, I happen to be in favor of criminal trials, and that's why my obligation is to bring them whenever I can, put people on notice of their uh, criminal conduct. What's the most legitimate form of detention? I think it's, you know, a sentence from a court based on a crime. It's the most sustainable, right? What happens 10, 20 years into a war? Um, and you're just holding them, arguably, just humanely detaining them off the field of battle. It starts looking like a punitive sentence, whatever you call it. So that's a great question at the heart of the whole matter. Anybody else? Sir, Ambassador. Uh, David Litt. Yes, I, I am a retired Foreign Service officer. Spent a lot of time in the Middle East, Southwest Asia, and Africa. Um, so my question is focusing on the uh, the hearsay issue. A uh, an outside observer like myself may make a very superficial uh, observation, like I'm about to do, with respect to hear the hearsay procedures in such a commission, when we all know that. Um, there are plenty of grievances and vendettas inside of clans and tribes, and you know that that information you've just gotten. You're not telling us who it's from, but we know that there are a lot of people from another clan that would love to. So, how procedurally, how can the defense present such arguments, right. and and where, well, how does it no, happen? It's a great question, it's, and it, it 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 really does highlight one of the changes in the 2009 law. Uh, prior to 2009, the opponent of the hearsay had to, had to, had the burden. 2009, the proponent must establish the bona fides of this, uh, this evidence. And remember, uh, the judge is taking into account whether the declarant's will was overborne, has to be in the interest of justice, and it is taking place in this adversarial process. But um, I can, there are instances where we have gone into a place where the first person who got to the, who was able to talk to the witness wasn't one of our forces. 
and yet we got in as quickly as we could, got a good law enforcement agent, an NCIS or FBI officer who did everything right, got the best possible evidence, and there were no indicators of uh, any sort of coercion, even though they were second to get to the person. And in fact, you know, bringing evidence forth was against sort of the, uh, the interests and the desires of the, the uh, leaders of that state, another sort of indicator that, that they, they, the, the evidence you're getting has reliability and, and that the individuals weren't uh, mistreated because they're openly talking about things that you know, would seem to be counter to the government, aren't making any complaints about, uh, they're not Mirandized, but they're, you're, 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 you're developing the totality in a way and recording it in a way that gives you confidence in it. International courts are going to take that evidence, right? I mean, under the Rome Statute, an international criminal court listening to the case is going to be offended by anything that taint is tainted by torture, but they listen to hearsay all the time. And, and, it, and if it has this character with the indicia, again, think pre-Crawford, uh, you know, residual hearsay exception, indicia of reliability, if the lawyer's in the, in the group. I mean, th there is good hearsay. And in, in a field of armed conflict, and this isn't hypothetical, right? I've had the privilege of going to a lot of the camps in Afghanistan that boots on the ground helped eradicate. Uh, I tend to think military and law enforcement modes are not mutually exclusive, that we shouldn't be seeing them as such, and that it was a good thing to do to get military involvement in that. But we didn't get chains of custody for all that. We got a lot of information about it. We have a lot, of, we, can, we can piece a lot together, but uh, it makes sense to have a different regime, evidentiary regime. But we still have to do it in a way that comports with our values. And that's a central focus of all this. Defense counsel are on this very, very, uh, focused on it, and they should be. They should be. Uh, the, the, the protections are going to be a transparent process, a judge that's not beholden to anybody, counsel who are zealous. You clearly have that. And you have jurors who do not want anything to keep uh, their honor from being clean, if you know the Marine Corps hymn. You've got to keep our honor clean. And I think that's an important protection. So um, great question, but it's, uh, it's central to the enterprise. Anything Mark? else? Yep. Mark, we've uh, unfortunately come to the end of our time. I just want to thank you, number one, for coming down here, but for really, I think, taking some time to work through in some detail exactly what the military commissions are and more uh, equally important what they are not. We may still uh, continue to disagree, but at least we're disagreeing from a basis of knowledge. And I think that's what you really contributed. I really, really appreciate it. Th thank you very much. <laughs>